All right. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for joining. My name is Andrew Silva. I'm a technical marketing manager here with Zerto, and today we're going to be walking through a little bit more detail of our, our new Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault. Um, I'll also be doing some Q&A at the end. So uh, the, I love this topic. Uh, I love talking about the Cyber Resilience Vault with uh, partners, customers, um, and even internal folks, and um, excited to hear hear from you excited to answer your questions so with that let's go ahead and dive in to the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault so a little bit of background um, I don't I'm assuming most people here uh, are familiar with Zerto but for those who are not familiar with Zerto we were founded in 2009 really with the sole goal of uh, being able to help our customers achieve an always on always available business so Kind of since that inception, we've grown drastically to over 2,000 partners, 9,500 customers, and over 100 uh, countries globally. And since then, right, if, uh, I think most of you know here, we were acquired by HPE in um, 2021 uh, because of the, the leadership we played in uh, disaster recovery. So here's an example of some of the customers that we've been able to serve, right? They're, they're from a, a lot of different verticals, a lot of different industries that vary in a lot of sizes. One thing all of these customers had in common was the need to run an uninterrupted, always on business. So being able to navigate the landscape uh, as technology evolves or new threats develop. And so that really leads into uh, some of the needs that we've heard from our customers, right? We've heard from our customers some increasing pressures uh, pressures that they're currently facing are evolving security threats, how to recover from those, navigating new regulatory requirements that um, our customers are having to adhere to, stricter industry certifications, and ultimately cyber uh, insurance demand demands. It's not just provide a checklist anymore uh, as it has in the past. Are you are you following these data protection practices? Um, there's there needs to be more proof, I guess, proof behind the pudding per se, right? So that really leads us to why there's a need for a vault, right? And I really like this quote from Gartner: "Isolated recovery environments with immutable data vaults provide the highest level of security and recovery against insider threats." ransomware and other forms of hacking, right? So really there's two things there, right? Just remember um, isolated recovery environments and immutable data vaults, and we'll, we'll touch on those in just uh, another moment. So kind of as we're introducing this vault, uh, let's, let's kind of take a moment and visualize the landscape we're looking at here, right? So when we're looking at it from, uh, a cyber threat perspective, and we're faced with a ransomware attack, right? Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, th this kind of attack framework, but this is the this is a common attack framework to to, to follow, right? A typical attack involves initial access uh, and compromise to your environment, then uh, with you know elevated credentials, getting command and control of different uh, you know, infrastructure, accounts, and then laterally move across the environment, compromising more systems, ultimately getting the control to disable, you know, uh, security and data protection services, leading to that encryption event where services are impacted and it puts you in a state where now you have to figure out how you recover, right? So the the thing we want, we're looking at from a vault perspective is what happens what happens here, right? What happens if the lateral movement goes so far where it compromises even your recovery systems? And not just your recovery systems, but your recovery environments, right? What if it compromises your DR target? You can have all, you can have all of your data protected and located in an immutable format, but if you don't have a means to recover that data effectively and efficiently, you're still not in a good space or in a good spot when it comes to facing these attacks. And that's why we've uh, introduced the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault. The, this vault is really designed to be a highly secure, completely isolated 
air-gapped lockdown vault with immutable copies inside utilizing unique zero trust architectures, right? So this is designed to be your last resort when everything else fails, right? This is what you can go back to to, to recover. Traditionally, when you think of vaults, right? Um, there's These are the types of vaults that are, are commonly positioned, right? It's You're thinking about a cloud-based immutable vault that some vendors utilize, whether that's uh, an Azure AWS backend that's utilizing object lock capabilities. You have dedicated uh, appliance-based uh, solutions that you know, manage immutability and access that are, that are purpose built for, for data protection. And then you have array based, right? Where um, you have production grade storage that has immutability and isolation capabilities that can happen on the array level. These are really kind of the three vaulting categories that, that we're looking at. But when we take a look at the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault, we are looking at the immutable capabilities of it. But it, we're going beyond that, right? What we're doing here is like that Gartner quote stated, we're really combining those uh, immutable data vaults with an isolated recovery environment and, and a clean room, right? So we're able to provide a very comprehensive uh, recovery option from a vault perspective as we compare that to traditional vaulting approaches where we're there's just a couple of elements that are that are really encompassing primarily around immutability and just having your data be protected, not necessarily accessible. So I've, I've alluded to this and, and mentioned this already, but what really makes our Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault different, right? It combines that isolated recovery environment with an immutable data vault, and it's from a single vendor, right? This is all from a single SKU, a single vendor from from Hewlett Packard and Certo, right? This is a um, this is a very strong solution, right? We're able to deliver rapid recovery and dramatically lower recovery point and recovery time objectives uh, because of some of the the capabilities that we bring from Certo with its orchestration automation from a recovery standpoint. And then when we're looking at storage, we're bringing electro production grade storage as a, as a recovery target. We're able to deliver a, a true air gap, isolated and uh, isolated environment that has no outside management capability, no persistent ports open. And we're looking at this from a very decentralized zero trust architecture. And when we compare all of the value that we're able to bring, we're able to be um, very cost effective compared to these type, these other types of comparable solutions. So let's let's dive into the architecture a little bit. Let's see what the the cyber resilience vault architecture consists of. We're gonna we're gonna kind of give give an overview starting on the right back to the left and then we'll kind of go through the whole the whole flow of the architecture from left to right. So just starting with the vault components, the main components that are made up of the vault, uh, it it's really Zerto, right? Uh, HPE or Pro Alliant Compute, HPE Electra, and Aruba Networking. Those are going to be the four components, right? So the the vault is like I said, an isolated recovery environment. And what makes it isolated? When, when we look at how data is moved into the vault, we're moving this from our, we're calling this a replication target, but it's a little bit more than a replication target. It is uh, what we're calling a landing zone. So basically the data that's gonna be replicated from production, leveraging the Zerto capabilities, right? Leveraging our journaling gets moved over to, replicated to our, our target or landing zone. And in our landing zone, we have HPE Electra storage, right? And the way that we then move data into the vault is over a air-gapped direct connect uh, to another Electra at the vault site. So wherever your, your replication target or landing zone is gonna be, is gonna be at the same site where your vault is. So what we're able to do here is we're able to facilitate 
what ports are being used for replication. We're able to turn on and turn off ports, but again, this is only, this is data only. This is no management ports. So to manage the vault, you have to be inside the vault. So what we're doing is we're able to take a snapshot of leveraging the storage of the entire state of of your your landing zone environment replicate that over on a periodic interval basis right by enabling and disabling ports kind of think of that as a drawbridge right we're taking these snapshots in a mutable format where of all of the replicas all the journals all the journal all of the zerto components needed for recovery so that's how we're moving the data over there. So then when we go to recover, right, we're simply mounting volumes to the host level, and then we're utilizing our recovery tools within Zerto. And I'll go into a recovery scenario um, later in the presentation so we can actually see what the workflow uh, looks like. So our, our cyber resilience vault is designed to be extremely flexible, right? If we have a customer that says, I have backup, how can I add my backup capabilities to the vault? You can absolutely do so. It's more of a sizing exercise at that point. But really, the, there, there's, the recovery elements of your backup data could be different because it's architected to be extremely fast with Zerto. But if you want to have that immutable copy of your data, backup data in the vault, we have a flexible architecture to be able to accomplish that. Right. So again, your landing zone would not just have Zerto in this replication target, right? But you would have uh, it, it would be your backup recovery target, and we would still be utilizing that same underlying Electra storage, and then moving that data over to the vault environment on that same interval schedule, or maybe even a different interval schedule, right? Um, that that we define. So then, if you did need to recover that backup data. You could then deploy your other backup services that uh, and proxy servers or things like that that can actually you know make use of that backup format and and be able to recover some of that data as well so going a little bit further on flexibility right we can also accommodate with, with zerto uh, cloud data right so from from a vault perspective, we we view this as a zero trust. We don't like we're we're looking at this if everything else fails, right? We don't want to have any external management, uh, any persistent management to the vault because any time you poke a hole, right, to the external, uh, you know, external internet for other resources, it's it's a point of vulnerability, right? So if you want to have ultimately that like secured data in an offline state even if it's cloud data we can simply utilize this architecture with zerto to replicate data from your cloud from your cloud source back to our replication target or landing zone where that data will then be landed on the electro array and then on that periodic schedule we're able to move data from the electra back to the vault site and now you actually have a vaulted copy of your cloud VM data as well. So this solution is really, um, you could think of it as almost composable in a sense, right? Um, it's a flexible solution, right? But the core of it, right, is again, Zerto, Electra, HPE, Proliant, and Aruba networking. And having all of those elements together really delivers that extremely aggressive recovery point and recovery time objectives when this is like the last line of resort so in a little bit more detail right what do the components of consist of right we've talked about zerto 10 right zerto zerto is a key element of this right this provides us that recovery orchestration and the granularity of recovery so if you're faced with a scenario we have to recover to the vault, you can determine the point in time you want to recover to. It's not just a single snapshot state because we're actually taking a full copy of uh, of the journal and, and be able to actually get extremely granular on to the point in time you want to recover. We have that HPE Electra storage, 
right? And that's designed, that, that's leveraged in our landing zone. It's leveraged in the vault and it really facilitates the immutability capabilities uh, that we're delivering here. We have our the HPE Aruba networking that's utilized for a management network. We have that as a storage network with fiber channel. We're leveraging that for kind of top of rack switches as well. We have the ProLant compute that's being leveraged for the recovery target and then we have some other management uh, server services that we're we're utilizing and then the resilience automation server i think you saw that in the architecture and that's really recovery management so really the the, the recovery the recovery management functions right and the configuration of uh, various port interval cycles and things like that is all going to be managed through this uh, automation service that we have deployed in that vault environment so let's dive into some of the some of the core components that really make up the vault in a little bit more detail i'm, I'm going to focus primarily on zerto and the storage because that's really where um, the value of recovery and immutability come into place and that's a big piece of the vault solution so when we think of Zerto, Zerto Continuous Data Protection, that's really, um, th these are really the components that make that up. So it's our, our near synchronous replication, our journal-based recovery that we're able to roll back to a specific point in time, that app-centric protection. So when we're talking about recovering our workloads, we can, the way that we protect these, we're able to maintain consistency across dependent components, right? So if you're wanting to fail over a group of virtual machines that make up a specific application, we're able to have kind of an application-centric focus on that. So all of those components are crash consistent amongst one another. Next, we have our real-time encryption detection. So this is uh, this is helpful to know if um, for, for some reason you had an anomalous encryption event, right? You had maybe a lot of, of encryption activities, right? We're able to look at the journal checkpoints and determine which checkpoints are are clean and which ones have been potentially compromised so that can actually really help with that recovery process and all uh, in combination with all of our other recovery and orchestration capabilities that zerto natively brings to the table so another key component of this right is our inline encryption detection and we'll whenever we go through I'll go through a recovery scenario just after we get through this and you'll kind of see where this comes into play for recovery. So with our detection that we're bringing to the table and it's part of this vault, it's part of Zerto, it's not just part of the vault, it's part of Zerto in general, but we're not waiting into the point of backup to validate if uh, you know data has been encrypted or compromised. We're doing this as encryption happens. So we're detecting it within seconds allowing our teams to, to really take uh, action as an impacting event is taking place. So that first moment of impact, they're gonna get an alert and administrators are gonna be able to ass assess, determine whether it's a false positive or if there's something going on. And because this is on a virtual protection group basis, right, we're not able to, we're, we're not just, telling you you're having an event, we're able to also identify that blast radius extremely easily as well. So a, a good example of this, right? If certain VMs of a applica if applications are infected, but but another set aren't, um, you, you'll, you'll be able to only recover the infected ones. So it's not an all or nothing commit. You'll be able to say, hey, these servers, these VMs, even these files, right are the ones that i need to restore so so we'll talk here um more in the recovery scenarios but it's a very um yeah it's a very impactful tool and we also know that security we know organizations have their own security teams right yet there's whole stacks of security solutions that companies have we have a very robust API. We take an API first approach with some of these capabilities. So we're able to even integrate this with existing security stacks to provide more visibility of what's happening in the entire environment itself. 
right? So you're going to be able to integrate some of this capability if you want to. This is a little separate from the vault, but you're able to integrate this to your existing security stack as well to just be another another tool, right? Because the, the hope is, right, you have all the tools in place to not have to leverage a vault, but we know that the reality is, the, the reality of every, the, the, the environment that we live in is uh, we can always face those catastrophic events, right? So we talked about the replication, uh, we talked about CDP, we talked about our checkpoints, right? Um, and not just being able to see the data coming in and get, getting alert, but be able to flag recovery checkpoints. This is extremely important when we're talking about recovery with the vault, right? Um, if, if for something, for some reason we replicated over, um, you know, to the vault site, some compromised data, but we have we kind of know when that compromise took place based off of the, the these checkpoints. It can really help that recovery process, um, and, and really help validate what the recovery is going to look like. Right. So we'll be able to not only mark suspicious anomalous when it took place, but we'll also be able to flag. Uh, and we can do this today, uh, is be able to flag the last clean checkpoint as well. So not only do you know when the attack, like when, when an event took place, but we know, okay, this is the last, this is the closest checkpoint to that suspicious activity that I should be able to recover to. So we're, we're, we've designed this to make it an extremely easy recovery process, even from a, from a vault standpoint. Another key element of the vault is the HPE Electra storage. So um, there, there's a there's a few things to note about Electra and why we chose Electra for the vault. So HPE Electra is first off, it's a cloud native data infrastructure platform, and it's designed for a mix of primary workloads and secondary backup workloads as well as disaster recovery. So that the the array is really built it's a multi-purpose built array so we're able to use this as a, a dr target for backups but then we're also able to run production on it right it's an all flash storage and it has um, six nines of, of data availability so when we're talking about wanting to feel that our data is secure we're going to have the ability to access and recover that data electric can really bring that to the table we also the, these arrays also have HPE info site. So what what this array has um, at the landing zone prior to entering the vault is delivering app insights, right? So with app insights, this is a HPE info site kind of offering, right? It extends the pr predictability and visibility into the uh, into the application. So it's able to look at apps infrastructure detect. Uh, unexpected activities, make recommendations for performance, right? And and continuously optimizes things on the background. And all of this stuff is going to be replicated at that site. So being able to catch any kind of performance modifications that we might want to make from from that Electra level and replicate that over to the the Vault environment is going to be extremely important. And it's just going to it's just going to better uh, set you up for success when you have to recover. Next is robust immutability, right? So depending on the HP Electra model, right? There are varying technologies uh, uh, and options to lock copies of data and avoid tampering by unauthorized users, right? So broadly grouped, um, there, there are two options, right? There's two industry standard categories, governance mode, which copies cannot be altered or deleted except by super admins right um and th that can also be uh, done by a, a dual authorization process right where you have to actually have multiple super admins to be able to validate and authenticate that these actions are able to occur and then we also have you know this stricter compliance mode where 
where copies cannot be altered or deleted by anyone, right? So this is this is really your your kind of true immutability, right? Um, these copies can't be altered by anyone, including super mad admins or HPE support, right? It's going to be it, it's going to be defined by that that whatever whatever retention policy was set. It's you know set it and forget it, and you you can't touch it. So these were all of the really the key benefits when it comes to uh, vaulting technology that we wanted to include in this this overall solution. So let's go ahead and dive into vault recovery. So this this is a big question that we always get asked. What does the recovery process look like? Like if if, if organizations are faced with um, a ransomware attack or, or any type of d data disruption that could involve utilizing the vault, what does this look like? So in this in this scenario, we're going to look at just kind of the the whole spectrum. What if we lose production, right? So our production site is impacted. We're we're not able to access. What does recovery look like from this perspective? We're kind of going to the the traditional Zerto methodology when we're looking at this. So we're starting. We're going to access the the replication target. We're going to log into the ZVM. Once we're in the dashboard, we're going to select the apps, identify those, what we want to recover. We're then able to go back to the journal, search the checkpoint that we want to recover to, and then be able to test power on that virtual machine, validate that the restore point is clean, and then you're able to recover all those workloads in minutes. That's more of the traditional Zerto approach for those of you familiar with Zerto. So let's take this a step further, right? What happens if we were if we remember that MITRE attack framework? What happens if you know we've lost our DR site, right? But we've had this vault we've 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 had this vault running at the same time. So what does recovery look like when we have to when we've when we've lost both of our primary sites that we run operations from? So the recovery process looks like this. So from the HPE Electra, right? We already have our compute infrastructure stood up over there. What we're doing is we're mounting, like we're mounting a VMS from the immutable snapshot. So we're we're, we're essentially creating a copy of that immutable uh, snapshot. So to so the, it's still immutable, but we have a copy of it now that we're able to now mount to a host, right? So once we mount those once we mount those volumes to this host, we're able to utilize kind of the the boot on SAN functionality. We're able to power on vCenter, ESXi, and all of the VMs that were really in the same state of our replication target. So once we're able to power on all of those components, we're then able to recover utilizing the Zerta Virtual Manager, right, to a specific clean checkpoint, and then from there. You know, we can we can do testing inside the vault, right? We can wait for at that point we can wait for our production sites to be in a state where they can we can then replicate and move data back. Same with our replication target. Or if that's going to take too long, right? You can then make the decision to open up ports, expose the vault, right, and temporarily run production workloads outside from the vault. Because again, all of the things that we are including in the vault are production grade. We're running production grade flash storage, we're running production grade compute, um, networking, et cetera. So it gives you a whole lot of flexibility from a recovery standpoint. So just a, a few things to remember, right? So we all saw the quote earlier about uh, immutable data vaults, isolated recovery environments, right? The Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault is really unifying those two with a zero trust architecture. So, and it is true, right? The way that we're managing the the air gap and the immutable copies, right, is is through that Electra, right? We are able to maintain full and true air gapping principles by by utilizing by having the data path only be accessible by the array. So there's no outbound communication to that vault environment. This is highly secure performant hardware, 
it's all production grade. I know I hit on that with the recovery, but I'm going to hit on it again because it's extremely important. So if you need to run off the vault temporarily, you can, right? You don't have to do the vMotions, the, the migrations back to other storage so that it can temporarily run, right? And and temporarily, I mean, depending on the depending on the situation, could be could be months, right? Um, like th 30 days is pretty average, you know, for for trying to recover from from a ransomware attack. So so something to note here, like with that production grade um, kind of talk track, a lot of other vendors out there that that are providing vault solutions, they're using second tier storage, right? So when we're talking about running long time, like uh, we're talking about to be able to run run for a long term, adding those additional uh, processes in place. And I'm going to hit on the the unique advantage we have with no centralized control plane, right? So when we're talking about vault management and how it's accessed, it's completely decentralized. So we're moving single points of failure, right, or single points of compromise. There's no persistent management ports. There's no constant pinging to a cloud-based service for SaaS management. Um, it, it doesn't have those management ports open 24-7, right? There's no external management points. It's not connected to the production network, and it's not connected to the internet. Really, the bottom line of this is this solution is designed to help our customers beat compliance requirements. The strictest compliance requirements right to help them recover during the worst kinds of attacks that that they can face where it really impacts not just one site but all of your sites right um and and we we're seeing kind of these strict compliance uh requirements starting to be mandated by a lot of different organizations and we're hearing that from our customers right and so that's what we've done here we've 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 really released the zerto cyber resilience vault to address uh, those issues. So I'm sure um, we're gonna have some questions, uh, but from an overview perspective, um, if you wanna learn more about Zerto, the cyber resilience fault, if you wanna understand how uh, our inline encryption detection works, we have labs available for all of that that are free. So yeah, don't, don't just take my word for it, right? And and the great slides that you just uh, saw here, drive, try to drive it yourself, right? Um, we we have ransomware encryption detection demos. We have all of these different types of recovery demos. And for and if you want to hear more about the vault, we can gladly set up a meeting for to, to meet with one of our engineers and go go into this in uh, deeper levels as well. So I, I really appreciate uh, everybody's time listening to me about the the vault. And now let's go ahead and kind of review some Q&A and see, see what questions we have coming in. Okay, so I think the underlying hardware architecture, right? Um, here's the question, so, so can a vault potentially support multiple applications. Uh, companies are typically want to avoid vendor lock-in with, uh, let me read the whole question, with the components of building a vault can be challenging. Yep, exactly. So if we if we go back to the, the talk track around um, kind of flexible applications, if you had a backup application that you want to do in vault or if you had other applications to, to do this, um, really you can, the, the core of the vault involves Zerto, HP storage, ProLiant, compute, and networking. But if you had additional applications that you wanted to run in the vault, right, if you had different additional security tools, you could easily deploy uh, those tools in the vault as well. Um, other questions that, that we get around that is, well, how do I up, like if I have other applications that I want to run in my vault, and I need to update those, how do I update those applications? So it, it's that same process, right? We're gonna be utilizing it, the Electra is the da data movement piece of that. So basically you'd have to 
have whatever files would be your, your updated your update files uh, be on a volume that is then snapshot and replicated by the Electra array. And then you could actually, you know, that, that's how you could not only update your applications, but that's how you could get your install files, right? If you wanted to do it that way, if you wanted to have a process rather than just, you know, you don't want, you don't want somebody just going into the vault and, you know, plugging their computer in and then copying files over that, that really ena enables you to, um, have a process and methodology. So that, that's a great question. Um, appreciate the question. Um, let me find another question. What security stacks uh, do we integrate with, right? So from, from a security perspective, right? I kind of just going off of that last comment, right? If you you have, we believe our customers have the best security tools. They know what's best for their organization. If you wanted to install those security offerings or those security tools within the vault environment to do more, you know, forensics due diligence before you complete a recovery process, you can do that, right? So you can utilize pretty much whatever security tools that that make sense for your organization. And then if we talk about our inline encryption detection we have we have a very robust open api where we're able to take those alerting events when we're seeing encryption events or abnormal encryption events and be able to ingest those into uh let's just say a, a sim at that point or a, a, a log manager right where you're able to aggregate logs and information and insights from multiple different systems to get a better uh, better more holistic picture so that's really the 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 approach that we want to take is, you know, we don't want to be the end all be all from a security standpoint. We want to be able to provide another data point that can help organizations see the fuller picture of what's going on. And not only just a, another data point, but a unique data point, right? An early, an early detection data point, right? That we're able to, that we're able to really uh, bring to customers as well. Yeah, so we have some we have some uh, good questions here um, around how do we differentiate before uh, normal application encryption versus ransomware encryption. So um, we we're, we're data aware, so we kind of understand what's happening with the environment, right? So we establish some baselines and and norms of what's happening in your environment. So basically, there is going to be a, a time period, right, where you first deploy the the, uh, the the toolings, right? Like you have to have something deployed for a period of time to understand what the normalized environment environment is, so we can determine what's anomalous and versus non anomalous. On top of that, we have um, several algorithms that that we're use, utilizing to kind of prevent uh, false positives. So they're 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 NIST accredited algorithms. Um, I can't go into too much detail because all of this stuff is still kind of patent pending around the app, uh, algorithms, but at a high level, that's really what we're doing, right? So we're looking for a normalized set of data, right? And if applicate, normal application encry encryption is happening in the environment, then that's that's part of that normalized um, data set. So, th so that's really how we approach approach this. So another question um, that I have here, does it work only with Electra or Nimble also? Um, so right now, this is, this is designed to be with Electra, right? So this is the newest, uh, the newest versions of Electra that we're working with right now. It is rolled out on the uh, Electra 5K and it is going to be available for the Electra MP when that releases as well. So, um, Unfortunately, uh, you cannot bring your own storage array uh, if you have an if you have a nimble array for this. Um, so the question is, uh, do we have to use a Ruby networking and ProLiant, or can you use other vendors? So, really, the the ProLiant compute and the other networking components are 
that it's a hard requirement for the vault, right? The Aruba networking is not going to be a requirement at the landing zone. Um, and there, there's a few reasons why we we're, we're utilizing all of these components. First, we've we've created a validated architecture that can be fully supported uh, by our support staff, right? So this this vault is it's not going to be a ton of different support teams. It's going to be one number to call, right? So if you have an issue with the vault, anything like that, it's not you're not going to be calling Aruba. You're not going to be calling um, you know the compute guys. You're not going to be calling the stores. You're going to be calling one number, right? And that's something. That, that we wanted to do. So we actually have to have the validated components from a support standpoint. And, and that's just really to better service our, our, our customers and be able to provide a, a, a better experience for, uh, for, for, for our customers ultimately. So, so great question. So yeah, the, the vault, um, if I didn't clarify this, so this vault is, you know, this is a separate offering from Zerto, right? So um, th this is, this includes the Zerto licensing. It, it's a bundle. It's it's a single solution, but it includes the Zerto licensing. It includes all the components for the landing zone. It in includes the compute. It comp includes the networking. It includes the electric, right? So um, they're they're t-shirt sizes, right? So based off of your environment size, we can we can determine you know which size of vault would be relevant for your organization and, and that's how it's uh, sized out so um, if you have more questions feel free to reach out to uh, you know, partner manager your partner if you're a customer on on kind of the costs and everything and how this works they they can definitely go into more detail with you on that Yeah, so uh, the Electra, what what Electra are we talking about? That's a, I think I mentioned it. We're we're talking about the Electra 5K right now, but we have we're talking about the, the feature availability that we're talking about the the different immutability modes, right? We're going to be able to get those stricter immutability modes when we when we look at moving over to the Electra MP. So um, there are several different capabilities, but those uh, but when we're talking about um, and it's primarily around um, immutability that we're talking about those capabilities there, there's some additional uh, differences but those are really the two um, models that we're talking about with the vault solution and if you want more details again reach out to uh, yeah feel free to reach out to your SE your rep your partner channel manager and we can definitely follow up on a deeper discussion around uh, the individual components there let's see if we have Yeah, so uh, this is a great question, right? If the vault is totally air-gapped, it has no links to InfoSight. So uh, I want to clarify, right? The InfoSight that we're leveraging is in the landing zone, right? So the landing zone is going to be at your DR site. That is going to be how, that's going to be, you, you are going to have connectivity in your landing zone, right? The, the InfoSight is not going to be leveraged within the vault target, right? So basically, you're able to get that insight from InfoSight prior to entering and that moving that data into the vault. So that's um, a little bit of a little bit of clarity, right? So yes, if to to leverage InfoSight and its capability in the vault, it, it's we don't have that enabled because of just the architecture and the way that the vault works, right? We don't have any external uh, management. Um, in the vault so just a little clarity on that is um, the uh, the vault is not leveraging info site but the landing zone which is part of the vault solution because you do get electrics for the landing zone you do get electrics for the vault in the solution that's where that that's where that info site comes into play is prior to that ingestion into the vault great question um, And last question. Hi, is this recording available after? Yes, the, the this is going to be this is going to be available um, as well um, after the recording. And I think we'll get one more question. Um, 
we're replicating on-premise to cloud. So based on this architecture, it needs to be uh, replicated to another on-premise DC with uh, with required infrastructure as mentioned, any option uh, available directly in public cloud. So right now it's, uh, there there isn't a public cloud offering, right? So if you wanted to, if you wanted to vault this, right? If you had your architecture, right? Where you're going to the DC, what, what you do is your, your vault would actually be located at your production site, right? So when you look at this, right? There's a, there's a few elements, right? The vault is, can be utilized in a multitude of different scenarios, right? The ones that we're looking right now is ransomware. So um, if, if you did have your vault located at your production, you could still have those immutable copies located at that same site. You could then have Zerto still uh, deployed in the cloud, and then that could basically just, um, it'd be kind of a doing a reverse replication from your cloud back to your production target, then doing local replication to the vault environment so that, that's the way the architecture would work um in that case so uh but but to your point right there isn't anything an option directly available uh in public cloud and and part of that right the, the reason for that is you know if we start having things in public cloud now we're looking at management Right. Like what is it like if we want to vault things in the cloud, how do we access, how do we manage that vault? There always has to be some sort of persistent um per persistent port open, persistent management, something to interface with so you can access and manage the vault. And while that offers a level of convenience, right? And and you know that that Could be a direction customers want to go is maybe the, the convenience uh, you know is, is a driving factor but the more things you have that over the way the, right oh i'm sorry did the i don't know if somebody talked but but yeah that's that, that's really how um that, that's really the thought process around um that as well Let's see, I'm going to do, I'll do one last question and then we'll. Question, so can a vault be sized to support 200 plus apps on 15K of VMs? Yes, we can size it out, right? The, we, we can, the, this thing is really designed to, to scale, right? Zerto is designed to scale. All of these things are designed to, to operate at scale. Um, so I think you can hear me now. I noticed uh, I got a little notification that my audio might've been cutting out, but we'll go ahead and make that the last question uh, for the day. Uh, we'll try to follow up with some more uh, answers to questions if we weren't able to get to it, but again, I really appreciate everybody's time. Thanks for joining. And uh, yeah, hopefully we get to chat soon. Have a good weekend, everybody. Take care.